Okay, Mary, we're recording now, so I'm going to introduce you. Um, <coughs> friend, Mary Pittman, and she wrote the book, The Little Book of Missing Money. Um, and she has a fascinating story, and that's just one of many things that she's done, um, including a long career um, as a nurse. Um, so Mary would like to just, and, and I, by the way, am Laura Alderson, um, founder of Best Boomers and Beyond. Um, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you today, not only because it's been a while since we've talked, uh, but because now I get to dig deeper into some of the things that you've been doing lately uh, and get caught up with you because we've been, both been so busy, it's been a while. Um, so let's start, and this is the challenge because there's so many things that you're doing and have done as in the second half of your life, right? Yes. That it's like, okay, where do we start first? And it's like, you are just taking off in an amazing kind of way. So could we start, if you don't mind, since we are about boomers uh, with your age? I am 59. Awesome. Okay. So you're 59, um, born in? 1955, June 1st. Okay. I bring in hurricane season. Okay. Coincidence? <laughs> I think not. Hurricane Mary. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Okay, so do you, can you identify and have you thought about how and when it is in your life you started really having a pivotal, a transitional place from how you had been living and what you've been doing, you know, doing the same thing day in and day out as a nurse, et cetera, to beginning to shift into new endeavors, which is when we met, by the way. Yes. Um, it was actually when I was watching a program called Donnie Deutsch and the Big Idea. And the previous week he had had on the guy who did, who created Bubba Teeth, the goofy looking teeth that you get at novelty stores, yeah. $40 million in Bubba Teeth. <laughs> and granted that was over a 10 year period. Wow. But the, fo the following Monday, the topic was, why didn't I think of that? And I just shook my head at the end of it thinking, I cannot believe these people are making that kind of money out of this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I said a prayer because I had had good ideas before, but I never acted on them. So I said, God, I am open to the next big idea. I let go of what I think it should look like or when it should appear. I know if it's something I know nothing about, you will bring me every person I need and every opportunity I need to make it happen. And for this, I say, thank you, God. And I let it go and the ideas began flowing. Wow, awesome. So when we met in 2010, the first mm -hmm. thing you created at that point, and perhaps it's because of what you just shared, but it was yes. a series of meditation and, and I think prayer CDs, right? Yes. Uh, I had a CD, Spiritual Affirmations for Prosperity, because although I had these great ideas come and I found that I was blocked, I just, I wasn't taking the steps I needed to, even though every door I knocked on opened up for me. Um, and I realized part of my problem was what I was taught as a child about God and money and prosperity. Which is what? Uh, poverty is a virtue and we all want to be virtuous, don't we? Yeah. So limiting beliefs around money and how yes. it's not cool and decent even to want more than you need. Um, yes. You know, and there's always the, the rich is often preceded with the word filthy rich kind of concept. Mm -hmm. No, it's exactly. A, it, it's very interesting. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because it is really a lot of what Best Boomers and Beyond is about. I mean, you know, some of my personal story as well, which we're not going to get into on this, but the concept of it's been a lifelong journey in beginning to ferret through and dispel the memes of conditioning that kept me trapped from becoming more fully who it is that I am, am able to become. Um, yes. But it's not just me. I mean, it's all of us. We all have different scenarios of that in different degrees of oppression or suppression of of possibility and mm -hmm. a lot of times it's unconscious i mean no one very likely in either of our lives intended it to be an ill will kind of thing but rather, absolutely yeah but rather we're conditioned by their conditioning yes so um so then you created these meditations in order to begin to help you remove your own barriers. And you went to an event to learn how to, because you and I both discover that, okay, you have a great idea, you create a product, so you get going beyond the inertia to the point mm -hmm. of creating the production, you know, which there are a lot of steps that go into that. Yes. And, and this, was some, right, this was something I had no experience in. Yeah. None. Yeah. 
Exactly. But and, I did it. Yeah. And, well, and that's such a good point too, because, and I know there's going to be so many of those in this conversation with you, but that is what tends to hold so many of us back. Cause like, well, where would I even start? You start mm -hmm. by learning the first thing that you need to do, right? You, know, you right. take the first step. And guess what? That first step leads to the next step and leads to the next step. And we tend to overthink things as adults, you know, unlike children, you know, they're not going to think about how do I literally take this next step as a toddler, but rather right. they just do it. And so that's what you did. Yes. And that's exactly it. It, it. One step led to another. It was really kind of a logical sequence. And, you know, with the internet now, you can find out how to do anything. Yes. You just have to have the belief in yourself that what I'm doing is good. What I'm doing will help others. And I'm going to do this. You have to have absolutely you have to have the belief in yourself and then take action on that. Um, and one of the ways our belief grows is, you know, because again, we tend to doubt ourselves and have fear about mm -hmm. what we don't know. Uh, but we're only one step away from knowing, you know, we're only one step away from knowing something more. You know, and then that step will lead to the next step toward knowing something more. So you and I were at an event to learn about because we create these wonderful products and then guess what? They don't just fly off the shelf, you know, or fly off the website, right? You have to think, right. let the world know, let the world know that it exists, you know, so that you can share what you created with others to, to help them, you know, if that's what your goal is, which definitely yours was. Um, and you were still wrestling, though, with you found one idea and you were getting it out there, but there was still a part of you, I think, that uh, you hadn't found your it yet, I guess you could say, or you hadn't found the big, your big idea yet, the one that you really, really lit you on fire. Is that fair to say? Yes, I thought that was the one, but until I found the one that lit me on fire, I didn't know that that wasn't the one. Okay, so fantastic. So let's talk about the one that fired you up. So how did that, just start, let's start with how did that okay. happen? One of the nurses at work told me about this website you could go to and you could find money that you didn't know you were missing. And I just rolled my eyes and sighed and thought, oh, God, you are so gullible. Because, of course, <laughs> I'm smarter than she is. And I said, I'm going to go to this site. I'm going to show you where the scam is and very much in a place of ego. And I'm playing with the site and I put in my maiden name and my father's name came up. And I thought, well, there you go. That just goes to show you what a scam it is. Why would they put somebody in who was indigent? <laughs> How would they know he was indigent? <laughs> How would they know I'd be looking? Maybe I have money. <laughs> and I did. Wow. I, I ended up, I, fill, I went through the steps. I filled out the forms. I submitted what I need to. And it's a little more complicated when you're filing as an heir. And about five weeks later, I had a check in my hands for over $2,500. I became a believer. <laughs> I still didn't have an idea for a book, though. It never occurred to me. And I just began um, in the middle of the night when I was waiting for a patient to come out from surgery, I would play on the site. I looked up our surgeons. I looked up my friends. I looked up my family. And I ended up finding a listing for one of the nurses upstairs. And she's one of those sweet, loving people who just has a perpetual black cloud over her head. Mm -hmm. And I thought, God, if somebody can use a break, it's her. So I took the information up to her the next time we worked together. And I, I was kind of hemming and hawing around it. And she goes, what are you doing here? I said, well, I have this hobby. I, I find missing money for people. And I found a listing for you. And it was a combination of her being ready to cry and speechless. And when she finally composed herself, she said, Mary, I've been getting calls and letters from attorneys and businesses saying I have all this money out there, but they all want a lot of money to help me get it. I was determined to find this on my own, but I didn't know where to begin. And I said, I will help you. Right. And as I walked away, I thought, I bet she's not alone. I bet there's other people who don't know where to begin. I should make a list of my search tips because I have some really great search tips. Just put it together in a little book, maybe even just a booklet, just the little book of missing money. And that's how the idea came about. Well, she called me back several weeks later um, at work and she was crying. I said, Linda, what's the matter? She said, I'm at the post office. I got a letter from the state of Florida. Two of the listings I submitted were not mine, but I have checks in my hand for, and she read the dollar amounts out. And it came to over, uh, I think it was $2,556. Wow. And um, 
she, she just started to sob. She said, I fell and broke my arm at a benefit for my cousin who got struck by lightning twice. And I thought, it's genetic. <laughs> yeah. wow. She said, I've been out of work. I don't have any insurance. And I didn't know how I was going to pay my rent. That moment, it went from a fire to an inferno. Yeah, awesome. Because $2,500 isn't a fortune, but when you don't know where you're going to pay your rent, you just hit the lottery. Yes, that's that's a great point. And that feeling, you know, so where I'm hearing what you're saying is that it wasn't just about the specific task of finding missing money, no. but it's but for you, it was about perhaps part of why you got into nursing in the first place. And it is that nurturing spirit within and that desire to contribute positively to the lives of others. Yes. Um, and now this was bringing together two things. It was like Santa Claus or, you know, it's like you were the, uh -huh. the, the good witch, you know, with, with the magic spell kind of thing. I'm mixing metaphors. Right. But, but uh -huh. there, I, and I totally, because of what I live for is to light people up, is to help them connect to their own incredible power and potential within, because so many of us have forgotten, given uh -huh. up, or never tried it. Um, and so I totally get when you can help to light up somebody else's life, there's no other feeling like it. Yes. And then for you to do it with actually something that would take them even further, you know, that really benefited them and, and mm -hmm. get out of the lost zone. Yes. And I, I do any radio interview that comes along, even 2,500 people in Shelby, Montana, because I never know who's listening. I never know who's going to go. I know that there's nothing out there for me, but I'm going to look. And it's, maybe it'll just be enough to put gas in their car or maybe it'll be enough to pay off their house. It's not up to me to judge. I never ask people how much they found. I'm just, I'm sowing the seeds. Yes. So, and so your book is titled the little book of missing money. And that is also your website.com, right? The little book yes. of missing money.com and the word the is in front T H E. Um, yes. And you also have a Facebook page, the little book of missing money. Yes. Actually, you just look up Missing Money Book. And it comes up. Yes. And, yes. And you've had lots of uh, press and you were, you were on uh, Susie Orman's show. Um, your book is in its third edition. Uh, yes. Still as well as hard copy, right? Right. <laughs> so, so that's, so, you know, what, what would you say is sort of, you said, so, so for you, the pivotal point in making the decision, you know, to sort of catalyze, catapult you into reinventing yourself, your second half of life. Yes. Um, so go back to that moment again for me. That was being, you know, realizing what it was, you know, what, what is it that gave you the momentum? It goes back to the big idea because other people had ideas and acted on them and, and they served people. Right. I mean, some of them are crazy ideas, Bubba Teeth, $40 million, yeah. but he had an idea and he went for it. So you, and, and so thanks for bringing me back to that because the other thing is one of the, as like with the books that I created, the My Trainer Fitness line of fitness products, um, I created it because I wanted something like that um, and it wasn't out there. And I thought, well, if I want it, then others would too. And maybe it's time to stop being in the court of someone should make X, Y, yes. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Be the, be that someone. Right. So, um, so you be decided that you could be that someone and now where it's supposed, so where is that taking you now? You've got the book out. Have you had other ideas that you've implement, implemented since then, or are you still focusing primarily on letting the world know in a bigger way about the, the book, the little book of missing money? Right now, I'm still focusing on the book. I'm talking to a major morning TV show about doing a segment on for Veterans Day for unclaimed property for veterans. Awesome. But I have a list of ideas that I I will get to and I will develop. Excellent. Yeah, keep those books right. Those those binders or those note. I've got like four spiral um, notebooks of ideas, and some of which should never see the light of day, uh, and some of which I hope to be able to get back to 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 develop. But you know that is a good point, and it's what you just said because so many of us idea people, um, mm -hmm. whether it's just you know creative brainstorming types, you know that like to think about creative things um, or entrepreneurs, we can so easily get bogged down in our own creativity by virtue yes. of too many ideas and not doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. 
It is, it, and it's, you do have to prioritize, is what's the next step I need to take to, you know, to get the third edition out. Right. Because when that's in the process, it holds up production of the book. The, the previous ones are no longer available. So that needs to be the priority. And then the third edition comes out and <sighs> sigh of relief. And then I've got to let the media know. I've got to let them know about these additional items. Um, there's more that my goal is not to look up people and see if they have missing money. My goal is to teach people, first of all, how to prevent it from happening. And second of all, how to search because there's more than just um, going to unclaimed.org. There's lots of other places that money can be that doesn't get turned over to the state. And there's lots of ways you can search. Yes. So along those lines, then, um, could you just briefly go through um, some of the things that, um, you know, because for instance, you were talking about the nurse that you helped the, the night nurse or yes. the nurse, nurse mm -hmm. and she had been approached by, you know, sharks or whatever, you know, I actually could just be people who they're in that industry, you know, to find missing money. For mm -hmm. You're certainly doing a service for those who don't want to do it themselves, um, but right. they're costly. So what yes. was something for people to watch out for, you know, in the services that are available, the do it for you services. Okay. This is a legitimate business for some people, but some people do it out of their um, garage. You know, just they don't have a license. They're not licensed by the state. And every state has laws regarding professional finders. And I list those in the, in, in the book because I wanted people to know what the law is in their state. So if they do get approached and they do want to utilize their services, make sure you're not being taken advantage of. I have a friend who is a stockbroker and he contacted me asking me if he, if I would help one of his clients as a favor to him. She was being contacted by somebody about a $325,000 listing for her husband who had died and he wanted a third of it over a hundred thousand dollars to help her. I said, it has to be stocks. Just wait it out. It'll go to the state. Oh, I don't want it to go to the state. I said, no, when it goes to the state, you can claim it for free. Hmm. But if you get contacted by a finder, the first thing you should do is go to unclaimed.org and don't put anything else in except those two words, unclaimed.org, and you can search any state you've ever lived in for free. The other thing is at the top of that website, there's an orange tab and it says other sources for unclaimed property. If you click on that, it'll take you to some of the federal sites. For example, there's 40 million savings bonds that have stopped earning interest and should be cashed in and reinvested. The estimated value is $16.5 billion. Wow. It's a staggering amount. But nationwide, the states alone are holding $41.7 billion. And that's an old number. They don't update that every year. They update it once every four years. So the next time that number gets posted, it, there's going to be a huge increase. But $41.7 billion dollars and oh my god say, did you say that it's not earning interest it, it earns interest for the state okay right so so there's kind of a disincentive right. for them to aggressively search for you sure yeah makes sense then i it's not their job it's not their job i mean really it isn't their job so i can see that um so uh, what so if those are the people to avoid, and then you said the site that people can go to, um, which was unclaimed.org. Correct. Unclaimed. They can also get a free copy of the first chapter of my book, um, Finders Fees to Pay or Not to Pay, and I've I put everything I know in that to help you avoid the finders fees. One of their favorite places to Let go. Let me interrupt you for a okay. second. They can get a free cop, a free chapter of your book. That chapter of your book on your site. Yes, okay. is finders fees to pay or not to pay because I want everybody to be able to have that and okay. do everything I can to help them avoid finders fees. Okay. One of their favorite sources for tapping unclaimed property is the clerk of court office. For example, if you, and this applies especially to boomers, if you've lived in your house a long time and you had a lot of equity built up in it, if you lost your house to a foreclosure and it sold for more than you owed on it, that excess money is yours. Wow. The problem is the check gets sent to the last known address, which was? Uh, 
uh, the house that got foreclosed. Right. And then it goes back to the clerk of court and they hold it for a limited period of time before they keep it. And most people don't know to look there. So if you had a foreclosure, check with the clerk of court in the county where the foreclosure took place to see if there was any overage. And professional finders will do that because people don't know about it. And sometimes those listings can be tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so it could be somebody who's lost their home because they can no longer pay the mortgage. And yet right. because of the market it um, and whatever circumstance, but then it ends up selling. If it actually ends up selling for a higher price than let's see, I'm trying to than what out. they owed. Than right. what they owed on it. Okay. So, right. Which is the equity. So then they would get the balance. Okay. Yes. So, so that's an important thing. Now, in your searching, um, what do you have an approximate percentage of the time that you find people that actually have missing money? You know, like, is it 20%, 80%, 50% of the time that you actually search, you find something? It can vary greatly. Um, sometimes I, I'll look up a, a group of people and I get nothing. Other times, um, like at the hospital, I found listings for probably 75% of our surgeons. And some people may say, oh, like they really need it. But my thought is that may create a credit for somebody. It may, it may um, do something if they had it turned over to the credit bureau. Once again, it's not up to me to judge it. I just put it in motion. I am the pebble in the pond. Right. And regardless of how wealthy someone is, if it's theirs, it's theirs. Right. Yeah. They worked for it. Right. Oprah so, had money. I let so, her know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> so Oprah had money, you said. Yes. Can you share how much? She, I don't know how much, but it was a insurance premium refund from her house on Fisher Island. But also, so, remember when she had Oprah's Angel Network? Yeah. There were listings for that. So there are listings for charities, too, and nonprofits. Wow. And which could be very valuable for nonprofits, you know, for anyone. Yes, but, with as hard as they work. That's right. And, and how hard many of them are hit, you know, with, with cutbacks and whatever. Um, yes. So, so really, it's not just individuals, but nonprofits could benefit from this. Um, and so what, back to the surgeons for a minute. Um, mm -hmm. I can imagine you were popular around the floors for a while. <laughs> so, you know, what were some of the examples of some surgeons that you found money for? And did they, you know, did, did it kind of spread like wildfire? fire through the floors? Yes. Um, one of the podiatrists looks at the listing and he goes, BCBS can't find me across Blue Shield. <laughs> they can certainly find me when they want a refund because it was his correct address. I have no explanation why he didn't get it. A couple of them, it was from places that they used to practice. One of our anesthesiologists got over $1,500. Um, another one, she didn't tell me how much it was, but it seemed to be good because she said, I want to thank you for that. <laughs> Excellent. So when you search for somebody else, you can't always tell how much it is. Is that right? No, not all of the states post the dollar amounts. I see. But like the last three speaking engagements I did, I found money for the host organizations. <laughs> so didn't you say you found some for Susie Orman also? I did. I was sitting here watching her program one night and I thought, wouldn't it be funny if Susie had missing money? Susie not only had missing money, she had never heard of it. She was a keynote speaker at Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach. I live up the road from that, quite a ways up the road, but <laughs> within driving distance. And I went to it because I wanted to let her know. I still didn't have the idea for the book. So I positioned myself to see her when she walked in. There was really only one way in, but not crazy stalker woman position, you know, <laughs> fine line. And I go scurrying up to her and she looks at me like, Oh, there's somebody else who just loves me. <laughs> and I said, Susie, I'm going to tell you something nobody else here is going to tell you. And she goes, what's that? I said, I found missing money for you. It's like she went into ventriloquist mode, frozen smile. Good, I need it. I said, no, seriously, you know the missing money sites? She goes, no. <laughs> no! <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about. I said, I was prepared for a lot today. I was not prepared for that. Right. So I start telling her about it and I start, start showing her the listings. And as I'm doing it, you can see this glint of recognition in her eyes. And she goes, these are people who owed me money who never paid me. <laughs> well, I said, here's the thing, Susie. If Susie Orman can have missing money, 
Susie Orman's viewers can have missing money too. And her eyes got really big. She said, oh, that's right. And I said, so, and this goes back to having an idea and acting on it. So I took the liberty of um, writing a segment for your show. You did? Oh, that's so funny. Do you have it with you? <laughs> well, yes, I believe I do. <laughs> KT, KT, take this, put this somewhere. So I gave it to her and she said, is your contact information there? I said, yes. And now it's my turn to be skeptical. I will contact you. Okay. <laughs> no, I promise I will. Well, she didn't. But when I had the idea for the book and I got it done, I sent her an email and got in touch with her. And KT said, great to hear from you. Send us a copy of the book when it's done. I did. And two weeks later, I got an email. Susie would like you to be on her new show on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Awesome. And I thought, well, it's not the uh, it's not the Susie Orman show, but Oprah's going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> and that would have never happened if I didn't take the step to contact her directly. That's right. And have the courage to stand up and introduce yourself. Yes. And just recognize that, you know, she's just another person. Yes. You know, don't let the, the facade of celebrity, you know, even deter you from thinking that you didn't have something to contribute, not only right. uh, to her, but to the world at large. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So that's fantastic. Is there anything else you want to say about Missing Money before we move on to your latest great success? Yes. Can I give a couple of tips to prevent your money from going absolutely. to the state? Absolutely. Please do. Right now, today, update your beneficiary contact information. Um, the person may have already died. In that case, it goes to their estate. And if it's, a, if it's a second wife and you hated her kids and all of her stuff went to her kids, then your money's going to go to their kids. So update your beneficiary contact information. Maybe it's as simple as they've moved. Right. But please do that today. It's easy to do. And that would include, okay, so that would include an insurance... Uh, any kind of insurance as well as uh, will. Retirement accounts. Retirement yes. Accounts. Okay. Yes. And stocks. And, and stocks. Yes. Okay. Yes. Update your beneficiary contact information. If you've been in your house a long time and have been current with your utility payments, ask for your utility deposit to be refunded. There's no reason for them to have to keep it for, to great, keep it for you. Keep in contact with your accounts. Even if you have professional people handling your money, and I have found money for professional money people, money gurus like Susie Orman, Gene Chatsky, um, Jim Cramer, if those people can have missing money, you can have it too. Keep in contact with your accounts. Have some type of activity on it at least once every three years. I say do it once a year, do it on your birthday, do it the day you file your taxes, National Find Your Missing Money Day is April 16th, but do whatever works for you. Once a year, make a deposit, make a withdrawal, call and check on the balance, log into your account, do something to show your activity. Good. Even call and say, do you have my current address, even though you haven't moved for 25 years. Something to show you know the contact is there. And those are my three top tips for not missing money. There's lots more in the book, though. Can you say the three again, though, just in the, the succinct part of the three? Yes. Update your beneficiary contact information. Ask for your utility deposits to be refunded if you've been current with your payments and keep in contact with your accounts. Okay. Have some type of activity. Okay, that's excellent. Um, there was something I was going to say when you were talking about that. Where did it go? Um, not remembering. Oh, well, maybe it'll come back. But um, so... Can you share before we move on? Can you share the last, the largest amount that you of money that you found for somebody, or that you know of someone that found through your book? Well, um, the stockbroker that I mentioned to you, I've turned information over to him. There was a listing in California um, for I think it came to almost two hundred thousand dollars. It was listed by the account number. Oh, and there was no person's name in it. I tried cross-referencing cross the address, and it looked like it was um, a business that was in that building, you know, lots of businesses in one building, and it was no longer there. So I turned the information over to him so he can contact that person um, because it would, it's a huge brokerage firm, but he's one of the brokers with it. Um, the person's brokerage firm was out in California, but... That money would otherwise never, ever be found. 
Right. Wow. And that's so unusual for it to just be listed by an account number. Yes. <laughs> so how did you find that then? You were, you were I was killing, I was killing time. I was, um, actually that was when I was, um, looking for people to invite on Susie Orman show. We were taping out of California and one of the, one of my search tips and one of the ways you can look is you sometimes listings, it will say the name of the, well, one of the ladies that I found money for, it was listed under Roth IRA. Now I know there are people named Ira Roth, yeah. but in this case, in this case, the second line, which was the first line of the address said FBO, which stands for the benefit of, and um, let's say Jane Doe. With that being in the first line of the address, it's unsearchable by name. And that was $1, $1,147. The producers didn't want to use her because it, it wasn't big enough. But after we taped the show, I thought, you know, I'm going to see if I can find her. And I did. So I contacted her husband and I said, I know this is going to sound like a scam. Please just read through to the end. You don't have to do anything. Just please read it. Because first of all, they hadn't heard of the show because we had just taped it and it was still going to be several months out. Um, so there was no reason to believe me, but they looked it up and I heard from her a couple of days later and she said, we did think it was a scam. I just got off the phone with the state of California. They can't believe you found the listing and I can't believe you found me. Let me tell you, this money will really come in handy because we are eight and a half months pregnant. Oh, I got chills when you said that. How awesome. See, and that's what I mean. I never know how the information is going to affect somebody. Right. Definitely. That's amazing. It really is being a little bit like, you know, like the bestower of divine gifts. You know, it's like a, a little bit of an angel touch here and there. The money angel. <laughs> yeah, there you go. So your next book, instead of the little book of missing money, it's like the money angel. It's something like the tooth fairy, but it's more product. It's more real. <laughs> a better return on investment. Yeah, that's right. Better return. On but you know, that, that's like one of the examples of ways you can look for money that you would never think of. Yes. It's not just last name, first name. Right. And because you've been immersed in it, then mm -hmm. you keep on exploring and discovering new ways to do it. You know, whereas most of us would start and give up kind of thing. Right. Put in last name, first name, go, eh, nothing for me. Not, not there. And there could be a fortune. And there were some, you, I remember hearing, overhearing you say something about some states have different ways of coding things. And so it's harder to find. Yes. Well, one of the things too, and this is timely with going into, um, into the gift giving season is some, st some states will take your gift card balance after a specified period of time. Oh. Isn't that special? Yeah. You save it for something special. You go to use it and you go, there's nothing there. Right. I haven't used it. Maybe somebody in your family did. Nope. Nobody knew where it was. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think that's a horrible thing for consumers because how do you find it then? Yeah. If you lost the card, how do you find it? And I haven't been able to find any listings for people with, see, here's the thing. The law of the state where it was purchased is what governs what happens to it. So if you're a teenager in Nebraska and your aunt in New Jersey buys you a gift card and your aunt in California buys you a gift card and they, they send it to you and everybody around the country because you're a teenager and nobody knows what to get for you <laughs> and you want to save it for something special, then you have to try to figure out where the gift card originated. It's a horrible consumer. It's horrible to consumers. Just there's no benefit. It's a money grab by the states. Gift cards in general. Yes. Yeah, I can see that because I know it's sort of like it's, it's trying to keep up with something and then remember that it has value besides just being a piece of plastic. Um, yes. And then a credit card. Yeah, I have had that experience with um, being concerned about losing. And a lot of times refunds will come on cards these days too. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you forget because you only shop at that store, you know, once or twice a year, then it's gone. Right. There's a great site that people can go to. Um, and you can also sell your gift card if it's one that you get that you're not going to use. The site is called Script Smart, S-C-R-I-P-T-S-M-A-R-T. It rates different gift cards on the value that you get for them. It also has a list of every state's gift card laws. So okay. you can check where you buy your gift cards. Is that a dot com? Yes. Okay, cool. That's a, that's a really good resource. I remember what I was going to ask just a little bit ago, and that is um, when you said about the missing, okay. money, the missing money day, the national missing money, missing money day. Uh, yes. Did you start that? Yes, I did. <laughs> Once again, 
You know, there needs to be. And I went to the National Association of Unclaimed Property Administrators saying there needs to be a national find your missing money day. I mean, something where there could be a blitz of publicity. And this was before the book. This was not book motivated. A national blitz of publicity where the whole nation can learn about it. Because if they knew about it, there wouldn't be, at the time it was $33 billion, there wouldn't be that much money. Yeah. Well, you know, we thought about that before, but the problem is when we get a real big bump in publicity like we did on Dateline, which was like 2007, <laughs> then the states get really inundated with claims. And I'm on the other end of the phone going, isn't that the point? <laughs> well, yeah, but there's only a couple thousand people to handle those millions of claims. I'll run it by the board again, but I don't know. And I never heard back from him, so I thought, I'll do it myself. Now, which, which board was this that you first contacted? The National Association of Unclaimed Property Administrators. Okay. Because that, to me, was the logical right. group to lead the charge. Now, is that, a, but that's a, um, is it a nonprofit or is it a government agency? It's, um, it's kind of like comparable to your doctor being in the AMA, the American Medical Association. It's a professional group of all the people involved in unclaimed property administration. Okay. Okay. So go ahead. You, so you, you continued then you said, well, if they're not going to do it, maybe I will. Yes. And I went to celebrate today and I registered the day and I, my thought was, what's well, a good day that people might remember to look for money <laughs> the day after you file your taxes. <laughs> So that was not accidental. I th that was planned. Awesome. Excellent. So do you have anything, speaking of planned, um, do you have anything planned uh, for promoting on that day in advance? Actually, coming up in 2015, it's the same as Holocaust Remembrance Day. And there are specific sites and information for Holocaust um, um, money and land and properties that were seized by the Nazis. Wow. So that's going to be, I'm definitely tying in on that. So you're doing your homework on that in the meantime. Yes. Excellent. Excellent. So Mary, you've been working as a nurse for how long? 33 years. Wow. Wow. <laughs> 33 years. And so, you know, I mean, that's, uh, it's hard to leave something that secured that you've been doing for that long. And, and you may not want to say in case anyone you work with uh, tunes into this. But do you have any thoughts on how long, how much longer you want to be a nurse? I would love to be able to write full time. Okay. That is my absolute passion. I would love to expand my spiritual affirmation CD line to do health, relationships, um, recovery, that type of thing. I, I feel very moved to do that, but I'm, I'm helping people get rich first. Okay. So you love <laughs> to write? Yes. Okay, so that I'm, is my passion. I, you know, I don't know that I actually knew that somewhere along the way. I miss, I missed that. Shame on me. But, um, I. So, what kind of things do you want to write? Besides what you've already done, what kind of things do you want to write? Um, I have an idea for a spiritual book. I've got maybe a quarter of it done. Um, is that an idea that's too close? It's still still in the womb, so you don't want to let it out to the world. It's it's still in the womb because I'm not. I'm not exactly sure where it's going. I, sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and I have to get up and I have to turn on the computer and I have to write. Awesome. Just the inspiration is there and it's, I can't hope to remember it in the morning. You're, there's um, along the writing, um, I was listening to, I've been on a Tim Ferriss podcast binge recently. I tend to, I, of the podcasts that I subscribe to, you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I can't keep caught up with them all, but I tend to go to the one that I haven't listened to for a while. Then I listen to all the ones on that podcast that I haven't listened to, or in the case of Tim Ferriss, um, starting at his earlier ones, because I'm getting <laughs> caught up on all of them. Uh, but at any rate, this, this one was with Brian Koppelman, I think it's uh, K-O-P-P-E-L-M-A-N, I think. Brian, he is a, um, a screenplay direct, uh, writer and director. Um, mm -hmm. He produced a number of movies. Um, one of the ones more uh, memorable, perhaps recently, would be Ocean's Thirteen. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, there, there are a number of different ones, and I'm blanking on the name. But we'll list it when we list her interview. Um, okay. He was talking about and he, so he's talking. He and Tim were talking about the um, 
discipline of writing and rituals for helping people write and for helping writers. And Brian mentioned that one of his favorites is um, Julia Cameron, who is an extraordinarily prolific author. Um, you can see, I'm pretty sure it's Julia cameron.com um and she wrote one of the her best known books is oh i'm gonna blank on this um brian koppelman mentioned this is sort of like the wonderful counterpart to the war of art by stephen pressfield which is another wonderful one um so you go to julia cameron live.com ah here you go her book is the artist's way and that's also you know part of her message but it just began uh you know a couple decades ago with her sharing her ideas with a few friends of how she gets going writing and some of some of the principles i'm gonna i'm mentioning this because i'm gonna list this in our interview since you talk about writing all this this is mm -hmm. versus also uh but sh but brian attributed her um technique or her sort of art is almost like a writer's meditation way of starting the morning by long handing three pages and then moving mm -hmm. on as being as helping him be incredibly prolific. And I know Stephen Pressfield of the War of Art um, talks about the discipline of writing every day, four hours. That's his thing. But whatever it is for you to do it every mm -hmm. day, because you set up that momentum, that continuity, and then you begin to tr to train the creative muse to let her know when to arrive, rather than mm -hmm. for the spontaneity of when she might choose to to join you. Not to men not to say that you shouldn't. You know, absolutely. If she strikes you in the middle of the night, then get up and go and dance with her. You know, mm -hmm. but time to begin to create that flow in your life. Um, so that your writing gets done, so that the work that's important to your soul and your heart uh, doesn't get set aside for when, but rather it is now. I'm not real disciplined that way because I work 12-hour shifts three days in a row, and then I'm on call too, so I'm kind of at the mercy of the job that pays the bills. No, 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 not at the mercy. You decide. So yes, you have mm -hmm. the 12-hour days. Um, but you have the other days and you may be on call, but you can still say right. okay, so when I'm not on call and when I'm here during this time, then that's what I'm going to do. Right. And then I update because I'm as I start updating the book as soon as the current edition comes out, because there's always new stuff coming out. So I do keep up with that, but I haven't I haven't been putting my focus on the other book and I really need to get back to that. That's because it. there's it's, some great stuff there. That's it. It's great stuff. And again, you know, you lit up when you talked about it. And so it's, it's like, um, it, it's balancing, you know, the big picture. Uh -huh. today. Um, but it's also recognizing that for most of us, most of the time, we don't have to wait to start the work that really matters in the way that you've right. already done. You know, you did that with a little book of missing money. You did that with the meditations. So this is just the next thing to continue mm -hmm. doing that with, you know, to open your, your, yourself to saying, okay, have at it kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I, the same way that you did. And so this is the last thing. I know we've been on about an hour. Do you have another five to 10 minutes? Sure. Okay. So the other thing I want to, uh, I guess we actually started a little bit late beyond the hour as we were working on our technical problems. So, um, it, but, I wanted to, uh, you know, you, you've done some remarkable things with your fitness and your health. Yes. When I first met you in 2010, you were a totally different uh, physique and energy yes. level and even appearance. You know, you were not mm -hmm. glowing and vibrant in the same way uh, that you are today. You were from the inside, but right. there was something, you know, there were some blockages there and, and part of it was weight. So you yes. transformed that. So would you like to share what you have done? you know, in these, in these past four years relative to your health and fitness? I have lost 54 pounds Woo! over probably about two years. Wow. Um, and there was no magic bullet. This was an internal decision. It came because I had a patient in front of me at the hospital. She had her gallbladder out. She was my age, my height, and my weight. And every problem she had was related to her weight. Wow. She had sleep apnea because um, her, her neck was so big. Um, she had high blood pressure. She had type 2 diabetes. She had bad knees. So of course, she couldn't walk. And she was my age, my height, and my weight. And I looked at her and I thought, my God, she's huge. And I thought, it's my age, my height, and my weight. And I've always known intellectually I needed to lose weight. But this was like a preview of a coming attraction. And I did not like this movie. Yes. And that was the kickstart for me. And I started by, first of all, I set five-pound weight loss goals. 
Because if I would have thought I need to lose 70 pounds, I would have quit the first time I gained three pounds back. Yes. But anybody can lose five pounds. And then when I lost five pounds, I reset my goal. I ate from the outer perimeter of the grocery store, excluding the bakery. (laughs) (laughs) Skipped the bakery. Um, And I've done this long enough now where I think I've actually reset my taste buds because now I can walk past the bakery and look at like cake glopped with icing on it and go, ugh. Yeah. And it's just, it's no longer appealing to me. The other day I was hungry. I had fresh broccoli. There was other stuff there. I had some sorbet, but I just wanted fresh broccoli and it was great. So this has been a lifestyle change for me. I gave up sodas for water or tea. That's Um, huge. Yes. That alone is huge. Yes. Yes. One of the doctors gave me a book called Wheat Belly and I suggest everybody read it if you, if you care about your health and Yes. And I gave up wheat and it should be available at your local library. That's the other thing. If you're interested in the book, check with your library and see if they have it. If not, they can get it. Um, Let's see what else I did. Of course, I increased my, my walking. I would park farther away. Um, I used the entrance into Walmart that, that was further away from where I needed to be. And I would always walk at least twice through there. Um, I eat foods high in fiber, not for the poop factor, but because it helps keep you full longer so you don't eat as much. Mm -hmm. Um, I ate slower. My main background is in the emergency room, so I was used to, you know, eating as fast as you could, and I stopped before I'm full. I'm okay with not being a member of the Clean Plate Club. <laughs> right, excellent. And some and, of that uh, early conditioning. Yeah, and right, and and getting smaller plates because you know we yes. looked at when you and I were little, uh, the plates mm-hmm. were smaller and the serving sizes were smaller. And so nowadays, mm-hmm. what we tend to do is we say, ah, oh, we look at the package and we say that serving size is ridiculous. Of course, you have to double yes. the calories because you know we're we're we no one eats that little amount. But then it's sort of like hello, what am I actually saying here? What we're saying is Mm -hmm. maybe we don't need to be eating more, but maybe that small, seemingly ridiculous serving size is actually Mm -hmm. more what the body needs. Yes, I I agree. But it's been a slow process. And of course, I had been going to the gym and I thought, you know, I should get one of Leora's books. So I got the, the middle one. My it's my gym trainer. My trainer fitness. Yeah. Yeah. And I went there, and the first day I thought, "Oh my God, I'm whipped." (laughs) I. It really gave me the reality of what I was doing was really not effective, and that was hugely helpful. (laughs) Excellent. Yeah, and you, you know, because you'd already been walking and doing some things, you thought you would start an intermediate rather than beginner. You were ready to get on with it. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, but that's a good point for anyone looking for to start is like, um, don't start so hard that you give up, you know, and mm-hmm. yet push it so that you, you definitely are uh, getting the most out of your time at the gym or whatever exercise you're doing at the time. And anybody can walk. It doesn't cost anything. I'm lucky enough to have a bridge nearby. So I walk the bridge frequently. And sometimes I'll do that when I get out of work just as a stress reliever. Um, there's no reason to not walk. So, if it's too hot to walk or too cold, walk inside a mall or walk inside Walmart. Yeah, and stairs. Do you do sta- stairs and steps when you? Yes, walk? I do the stairs at, at work. Excellent. And um, do you still? Are you still doing any kind of weight resistance training? Yes. Good. I, I'm still at the gym. I'm cool. still toning up. Excellent, because that's so important, not just for the physical appearance, right? But mm-hmm that helps everything else, you know, that developing and building and stressing the muscles generates the hormones that help so many other things. It's one of the reasons these uh, bodybuilders in the gyms, and I don't know if you noticed that a lot of the guys who are bodybuilders in the gym seem to have this almost, you know, rosy, cherubic kind of bright, fresh skin. Um, And, you know, it's part that human growth hormone is one of the hormones that's good for the skin, you know, so, and, and not only that, I don't know if you had issues um, as eight with aging with, bone density loss as I did, which is what started me on my journey. I was had um, was an osteopenia, the precursor to osteoporosis, which is mm-hmm. why I had to get started with weight circuits in the first place and resistance training. 
Um, and so you have to, there's just one of those things that just like, well, we know this from the study of astronauts, they lose bone density and muscle mass and without resistance of gravity. And so resistance training is really important for the development of bone and muscle. Mm -hmm. My last um, bone density, I was above normal. So Excellent. good for you. Excellent. So mm -hmm. well, and you're doing the resistance too. Yes. Excellent. So, and those those guys with the rosy cheeks, they don't go to my gym. <laughs> <laughs> I get the guy who who has steps of, of the fly and then sits there with his iPhone Aww. for you know twenty minutes. And Aww. then I'll do another ten and I just want to go up and go, You done yet, Princess? Because I'd like to use that and that's the only one here of that. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't understand why I'm not losing weight. I go to the gym for an hour. <laughs> Well, and on that, you know, actually, since that's one of my saws or what do you call soapboxes that in case it's helpful to others, because there really are people who are genuinely trying to lose weight uh -huh. um, and not doing it. Um, and one of the things that will do that, and that is, that is also steady state cardio. And that is, for instance, at our gym, there's a man who works out of our gym and he's been there as long as I've been going. And uh -huh. he's heavier now. And yet he pounds that treadmill so hard you know for 30 45 minutes you know every time he's at the gym but that's all he does and so mm -hmm. and so what happens is when we get to that steady state cardio and we're you know we actually build up cortisol which is a stress hormone which actually mm -hmm. brings on weight you know when it is because the body says oh i know what we're doing we're doing this hard thing that we can survive and so let's give more stress hormone so that we can survive this hard thing until we're done and the stress yeah. hormone is one of the things that brings uh, weight and fat around the belly as well. Um, whereas if that same person would do weights um, and high intensity sprints on the tre treadmill or outside or on the bike or elliptical just a few times a week, that would shift the metabolism and catapult things. So, so mm -hmm. that's the thing. If you're noticing, not noticing results, then just shift it up and change things around and go heavier, go harder. You know, listening to your own body of course so you don't overdo um and and change it up so you're right that you know there are people who are not understanding uh, why they're not improving so but you are yes <laughs> i'm so close to my goal and now i'm even doing belly dancing too awesome awesome so have you how many classes have you done four excellent and you're enjoying it it kicks my butt it's amazing. I've done it once and it was so hard. I was like, oh my I, God. You know, I, I grew up in Hawaii. And so I had some exposure mm -hmm. to experiment to a little bit of hula, um, but, mm -hmm. but it had been a many years and you just forget. It's kind of like racing and sprinting. It's like, how often as adults do we break out into, you know, a, a, a dead neck, dead neck running, right? We, we don't. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't without a little bit of warming up, obviously, right? But mm -hmm. The bottom line then is our body loses some of the ability. So similarly, if we're not moving our hips, you know, in all kinds of different directions, we actually lose the mobility that is still good for the internal organs and the torso, right? Yes. And I posted on Facebook last night. I said, this class has probably uh, rolled the clock back 10 to 20 years because I'm moving parts that I didn't know were immobile. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that's a good set. So, so that's something to start to put on your bucket list. If you're looking, if people listening are looking for, you know, an interesting, fun exercise to do Zumba, I really enjoy Zumba. Um, and that loosens you up. And then so belly dancing could be a fun one. Um, but so Mary, if you could share your thoughts as we're coming to closing up on today's conversation, um, on creating the second half of life, you know, so, so it's like you're not at all thinking about winding down. Oh, no, not at all. So you may be not in, even close. Right. And I mean, I see you on your Facebook. You're out at, at concerts and parks and you're always doing something into something. Now you're doing belly dancing. Now you want to write. Um, so what can you share that will help inspire, and motivate others to look at the second half of their life is now it's your time to shine. <laughs> Look back and see what messages you were given at an early age. What did people tell you that you could do or you couldn't do? Because they don't know. You can do anything that you set your mind to. And it's okay to not know. But take the first step. You'll be surprised. And don't be afraid to ask for help. That's the other thing I wanted to mention was people generally want to help other people. Yeah. And when I had my, my original idea, which I ended up not doing because um, I couldn't, 
I didn't have enough to follow through with the appeal of the patent. But every door I knocked on and asked for help, people said, sure, I'll help you. Wow. You don't know unless you, unless you ask. And no matter how big or how crazy the dream is, do it. At least take some steps to see how far you can go. Because you'll be surprised. And once you get to a certain point, all of a sudden you'll go, I got this. Yeah. I can do this. That's right. And you can, because there, the other thing is, even if we get, embark on something that ends up not working out as well, like your original meditation CDs that haven't mm -hmm. flourished yet, um, mm -hmm. look what else you discovered along the way that you never yes. would have had you not mm -hmm. started with that. Yes. So one of the quotes, one of the quotes that we use around here is that to walk daily in the directions, in the direction of your dreams, you know, so I love that take steps daily in the direction of your dreams, mm -hmm. the only way to arrive, uh, but it is a sure fire way to arrive. And yet if we were to start a journey, you know, from here to California, you know, we set our path, we know where we're going to go. Um, and we know the route we're going to take, but we're also open to the billboards and signposts along the way. That might mm -hmm. know that there's something else of value to see along the way from what we than what we might have known that what might have been evident to us when we're sitting at home planning the trip. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that's awesome. It's been really awesome catching up with you, Mary. And it's been um, great, Liara. Thanks so much. You're welcome. And uh, we'll we'll do another one another day. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.